Instead of just being uh, designers for wealthy clients, how can we be designers for clients, just all humans, regardless of wealth and power? Do you know this, what this bracket means? Yeah, do you know what this bracket means, guys? What do you think this bracket means? You'll use that a lot in this, in this year. Do you know what that bracket means? This is basically, uh, so this is felicity sentence, but with my idea in time. Right, yeah. This is what the student asked, and this is my my little contribution to that question. I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna add this. We have to keep track. Like when you're taking notes, you're reading. Let's say you're reading. I don't know. Hypothetically, you picked up a piece of literature. Uh, I don't know by Ananya Roy about informality in, in the private development of India. Just hypothetically, and while you're capturing, you're paraphrasing what Ananya Roy was presenting in this piece, an idea comes to you. And it's, I don't know, it sounds, seems valuable. And you don't want to forget it. But you don't want to forget it. But it's not an Anya Roy's idea, it's your idea. How do you keep track of what's an Anya Roy's idea? And you have to footnote it when you refer to it in the paragraph. And what's your idea? You don't footnote it because it's your idea, you're the author. You put it in square brackets and keep moving. So what's happening wrong with me? What happened to me this moment, Felicity, is that I, I, I have had a reaction and a possible answer in discussion about your question. I think I didn't put that in brackets. I don't want to forget that. Yeah. 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 Uh, Colton. Oh, okay. So. Uh, Yeah, that's a big one. That's a big one. Every time we make the city better, what what's to prevent that from being gentrification? <laughs> you architects, you show up in our neighborhood, and we know what's going to happen next. You're going to make it better, and then people wealthier than us are going to come, and they're going to drive up the costs, and we're going to be forced out of the neighborhood. You architects are gentrifiers. We are gentrifiers. The better we do, the worse it gets for the people we might be trying to serve. We might be trying to serve their interests first and foremost. But by making it better, we make it worse as an unintended consequence. How do we anticipate that unintended consequence? Well, and that's a very difficult one. Let me tell you a very brief experience. I have. I was working for. For the, for the city of Queens. So I yeah, was working, um, creating some participatory design projects to, to work in certain public spaces in Washington, Queens. Mm -hmm. and so we were discussing that with the community and the community, the first thing that they say is, we don't want this to come because we know what happened in New York. In Williamsburg especially. Uh, especially in Williamsburg. We yeah. know that we, if you, do a great urban project, we will be this way. Right. So we have we prefer to have our crappy the city, yeah. our crappy uh, streets, because we, because we want to stay here. So how do we have this discussion? Because people are basically skeptical about the urban renewables, the power job because of this movement. And have you, seen, have you ever seen Shameless? What happens in Shameless in Chicago? I mean, What's the strategy to keep it from being gentrified? They trash the place. It's brilliant. Yes. We should all watch Shameless as home. Yeah. Right? Okay, any other questions? Just move. Okay. So I'm going to start. We're going to do tag team. Um, we used to call them slums, but we don't call them slums. That's derogatory. If you lived in a place and other people are calling them slums, how is that supposed to make you feel? 
So we don't call them slums. We stopped calling them slums. We started calling them informal settlements. Ah, very awkward. There is such a thing that is technically true. There's a, a formal sector of the economy, legitimate businesses that have licenses and pay taxes. That's the formal economy. But when I go to a store and I buy a, a box of ballpoint pens for $5 for 20 pens, and then I sell those pens on the sidewalk for a dollar each just to have money to survive, I'm not paying taxes. I'm not, I don't have a business license. So I am part of the informal economy. Because of that relationship, we got into the habit of referring to informal settlements because they're they're not official. They uh well, we we think of them as not being official in the United States context. And so it's gotten a bad habit of calling them informal settlements. But this man uh standing before you is one of the people who have pushed back against that. So we don't call them informal settlements anymore. We call them self-produced yeah. yeah, can I add something to that? Please. And, and something that is, for me, very important is this dichotomy between the formal and the informal invites us to believe that the informal is a thing. So because at the end, for, the, what is formal, or, or what is informal, technically, is everything that is outside the current, and then that word is important, yeah. the current regulatory system. So currently, there is no regulation for the that things we, we call that informal. But informal is not the same thing than illegal. So let me give you an example. So we are professors. Imagine that we discover that we need more money because our, our salary for, for being professor is not that good. So we decided to come one day and put a table and sell apples in the, in the world. That is, that is informal. We have no permission in this university to sell apples in the world. If that happened, they will be the Wentworth police uh, Department yeah, safety. Safety, and they will say, professor, you can do that here to class. You have more provision. There is a person who are paying rents and something to sell these apples here. This is this is not good. You have to stop like that. And then you will gentle asking us to stop that thing because it's important. Are you following me? But imagine that instead of apples, I sell cocaine. Okay. Cocaine? Okay. Yeah. Is that is that not only important, it's illegal. If that happened, I will go to jail. So there is a huge difference yeah. between informality and illegality. A huge difference. So every person that, that calls that informal in many in many informal settlement in many moments, they say, okay, they are not legal because they are not in the current regulatory framework. Okay, what happens if we change the framework? The regulatory framework, and we are all said they are formal. And then that's what Ananya Roy was writing about. The, yeah. So my point is that so the other thing that we are a little uh, against this dichotomy between informal and informal is that because there are basically some rules that we can have to, to include them. There are, there are not necessarily illegal. There are not people that should, should be in jail because they, because they are doing their own threat. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's the first slide. We got through that. That's good. Well, the first a similar thing is what's the difference between, oh, ignore that. What's the difference between um, well, we bring up the idea of population. Here's a little bit of detail on the population. This is the birth rate. It peaked in 1968 at 2.1% globally. This is like we lump all humans in the world together. Uh, those families, uh, there's a birth rate of 2.1% in 1968. Ever since, it's been coming down. It started coming down first in Japan, in Italy, in Europe, uh, and the United States. Uh, so the birth rate is going down, but there are more people having babies, more women having babies at a lower rate. The population still goes up. It's a math thing, I don't know. You don't, you don't you hate me. We use math all the time, these articles. But people have asked, why is the world why do you, what makes you think that the population explosion isn't going to go back until we kill each other? Well, we know it's not because the birth rate is going down. See that? Is that okay? The birth rate's going down 
but it takes a while for that to show up and show up in the absolute numbers. Ask someone you know who understands math. That's that's the math. So yes, we do expect the global population to peak at 11 billion, more or less, in the year 2100, more or less. You know, if, if things go well, you'll still be around, right? Most of you will be still around. See that. So ignore the fact that we're at 8 billion now. And, ooh, ooh, I'm scared we're going to be at 9 billion before you know it. Just relax. Forget about 8 billion. Forget about 9 billion. Keep this number in your head. 11 billion. Peak human. I made that up. Peak human. 5% comes to me. Okay. The other thing that happened in 2010. Uh, the UN announced that 50% uh, of humans now live in cities. The, uh, the human population is moving from uh, agricultural dispersed settlements and they're moving into cities. We had 50%. But this is increasingly not important. You're going to talk about planetary urbanization? Uh, I can. <laughs> so before we do this, there's a man named Hans Rosling, uh, Scandinavian somewhere. Uh, but uh, my work for the Korean project, WGBH. And um, he said, let's take all these statistics that all these institutions are pulling together and let's put it into a single unified database and let's do data visualization to see if we can figure out what the heck is going on in this world. And so he did that and in the series of beautiful TED Talks, he presents a story of the world that is very useful for us in this course. You've heard the word third world. You've heard that word, right? And you probably have used the word, and you probably have used it in a way that says we're in the first world and they're in the third world. Well, it's time to get over that, because those days are gone. Uh, we could go back in time and we could say the first world, uh, at the end of World War II, the first world were the uh, capitalist states, the United States, uh, Western Europe. The second world is the communist countries, mainly China, Soviet Union, Cuba. And the third world are those newly independent countries that emerged out of colonial oppression and gained their independence and said, listen, we're not going to you can keep fighting over us, but we're not gonna join the capitalist world and we're not gonna join the communist world. We proudly separate ourselves off deliberately. They self-identify. We are the third world. We are the non-aligned nations. They did it in Bandung, Indonesia in 1955. And that was the beginning of a movement that said, you two Cold War warriors can fight all you want. Leave us out of it destroy each other, but we're going to go our third way. We don't trust either one of you. We're the third world. We're proud of you. So uh, it was a good thing. And it tended to be what we then later called the global south. The northern countries were uh, North America, Europe, Soviet Union, you know, China, north of the equator. And the global south was Africa, South America, and the islands and all of that. So Yes, at the end of World War II, there was a first world, a second world, and a proudly separate third world. It was a source of pride, not of shame. Then, then this happened. Let's see how this works. We move up into that corner, and in the 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries, and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family, and we have a completely new world. So that didn't play from the beginning, I'm not sure why. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to oh, about 70 right. years. And in 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had 
small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? Still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we stop the world. And this is all the UN statistics that has been available. Here we go. Can you see that? It's China, they're moving against better health, they're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The other ones here are the Arabic countries and they get lost. Larger families, but they no, longer like, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s, here you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh. It's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Wow. See that? No more third world. Let's see that, uh, an instant replay. Family and we have a completely new world. We don't film everybody feeling things. But there's a problem with this. Uh, it used to be at the end of World War II that there are wealthy countries and less wealthy countries. But so much of what's been happening is cloaked if you just look country by country. So what happens if you look at populations within countries? But first, let's look at Vietnam. I think that's what we're going to do. Let's just compare Vietnam and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Well, we Let me make a comparison directly between the United States of America and Vietnam, 1964. America had small families and long lives. Vietnam had large families and short lives. And this is what happens. The data during the war indicate that even with all the debt, there was an improvement of life expectancy. By the end of the year, the family planning started in Vietnam and they went for smaller families. And the United States up there is getting for longer life, keeping family size. And in the 80s now, they give up communist planning and they go for market economy and it moves faster even than social life. And today we have in Vietnam the same life expectancy and the same family size here in Vietnam, 19, 2003, as in the United States, 1974, by the end of the war. I think we all, if we don't look in the data, we underestimate the tremendous change in Asia, which was in social change before we saw the economic change. And everything that happened in Asia in this time period, we know what's coming next. It's now going to happen in Africa. And that's why we sometimes talk about Africa as the continent of the 21st century. But let's look at what happens inside of, inside of countries. So this is a graph that basically looks at uh, South Africa, the richest 20% South Africa are up here, poorest 20% South Africa are here, Uganda, Wealthiest 20%, poorest 20%, and Sierra Leone, wealthiest 20%, poorest 20%. So within these three countries in Africa, you have the whole world of wealth and poverty. So you can no longer talk, even if you say, okay, Sub-Saharan Africa is different from Africa. There are 55 countries in Africa, and every one of those countries is at least five different countries in the old way we used to think of it. And now these separate societies, these separate economic worlds exist side by side, a few hundred meters from each other in cities. And where else has this, do we see this first world, third world split? 
We see it in the United States and we see it in the cities of the United States where in downtown Los Angeles, you have homeless people earning, you know, they have access to less than a dollar a day and they're sleeping on the sidewalks uh, in front of uh, luxury condos that are the, among the wealthiest of uh, households in the world. And they're a few feet from each other. And sometimes they're in the same building. Sometimes, yeah. If you're, if you're curious about that, look at the YouTube, uh, uh, a documentary on YouTube called The Ugly Door. The Ugly, about the ugly, the ugly Door. Door. And it's, it's how certain buildings in Manhattan, uh, half of the buildings are for the wealthier, half of the ones for the more. Oh, and they gave them a separate they're door. They're the same building, but in a separate door. And one part has uh, pools and gymnasiums and all of that. And the other part has all of that. Because. We wrote the rules that said you have to uh, have 15% inclusionary zoning. If you want to build a building with more than 10 units, and this is true in Boston, and this is going to be part of your practice, uh, if you want to build uh, a multifamily dwelling, uh, which you did in Studio 5, I think, unit housing. And you, did you learn about this, inclusionary zoning? If you have more than 10 units? I will put that in May like that. Yeah, OK. So, but, but the good point here, just I come, come back to this point, is that this division between the wealthier and the not and the and the poor happens at different scales. That's just the that is the main point, if I can right. the yeah. main takeaway that the, the right. of these program comments that happen at different scales, it's not something that happened in the world. It happens also in our neighborhood. Right, exactly. So when you use be careful about the using the word third world. Unless you're talking about a historic condition from the 40s or 50s, it's inappropriate to use the term third world. It's not a thing anymore. And we have it right here in our own neighborhoods, a short walk from this lecture hall. You have both worlds. You have the wealthiest and you have the poorest people. The second point that I, I need to make very quickly is that all of this optimistic economic transformation that we just saw in these exciting bubble uh, graphs, uh, it's not guaranteed that it keeps going well for everyone in the world. As a matter of fact, if Hans Rosling was still alive today, the kind of graphs that he'd be showing now would be about displacement, internally displaced peoples, uh, otherwise known as refugees, has never been higher than the last few years. And uh, some say, well, it's war. The wars that have broken out have been displacing people. But what are the sources of those wars? Why did the Syrian civil war break out when and where it did? It happened because of climate change. Climate change is impacting people's abilities to survive on the lands where they live it's increasing competition for water rights. It's increasing competition for everything. And people are being displaced off the land by warfare triggered by resource scarcity that is a result of climate change. So you may think of climate change as Priuses and carbon in the air and all of that, but it's, it's not just that. It's also life and death. It's Palestine, Gaza. This is... These wars are not separate from resource scarcity caused by climate change. And it's increasing and it manifests in, in being displaced off of land. And so now the next principle uh, is push forces and pull forces. How many of you grew up in Boston? How many of you came to Boston to go to college? How many of you were, uh, so you were pulled, you were pulled to Boston by opportunity. How many of you came to Boston because uh, you were evicted out of your home where, somewhere else and you fled to Boston for refuge? Not me. Okay, one. So what's the difference between the push, the pull force of coming to Boston because it's a place of opportunity versus the push force. I 
was pushed out of my home and I had no other place to go. One is extremely positive. The pull is very positive. One is extremely negative. The push force being pushed out of your land and having no place to go. That's when your you know, wealth disappears. You become victims of crime and arbitrary bureaucracies. You end up jailed or dead uh, or both. Uh, and so the refugee crisis um, has been booming. And it results, um, people end up in, in camps, in refugee camps, in bizarre situations. Uh, one of my colleagues who, we had a big urbanism bump uh, a few years ago, and so uh, I defined someone to co-teach this class with me. Uh, his name is Ali Khodar, a graduate of MIT. Do you know him? Um, he's from Beirut. And he came and he shared some of his research. The city of Beirut is a city of refugee camps. And back when we used to do our analysis from lower orbit, uh, we would do exercises like this where we would try to read the urban fabric for density indicators so that we could make sense. That's what he did with his research. And uh, he identifies places that developed uh, from uh, economic prosperity and development, and then other places with, that started out as refugee camps. And these refugee camps, we often, we pretend, we, we fantasize, we delude ourselves into thinking, oh, well, these refugees will come in, we'll put them in these camps, and then when uh, peace is accomplished in a year or two, they'll go back home or they'll move on. Um, but don't believe it, refugee camps tend to be permanent. And so several uh, thesis students at Wentworth have developed planning for refugee camps that uh, are anticipate formal uh, permanent city settlements. And so that's, this is uh, a legitimate uh, view of that. And so the things to remember is third world is everywhere now that uh, the climate crisis has pushed people off their lands and not pulled people into cities. It's a very negative thing. And what was the other thing? Sorry. Yeah, it's just two. Just remember those two things. And then I tag you in. Okay, so, uh, so I don't know if I have... You have slides? I have my slides, but there is a thing that I'm debating myself if, if I have to talk about the theory of dependency or not. So, but it depends. Or do you want to hear about theory of dependency? Do you want to hear about that? So, so probably this is a short slide that can explain why why that happened. So, why after the division of the of these three worlds, there is a moment that that have a huge amount of migration. So. So if you go, let's go to the slide. So we are improvising a little bit now, but I think this will be useful for you. I'm gonna to move to the last slide. We go to our water folder. Ah. Malfunction. So what are you trying to do? I'm trying to get into Chrome. Okay, I'm into Chrome. There we go. I'm gonna to go to slides. Yeah. So you, you continue, I'll find so what, it, what, it, what, it, what it will try to explain, and, and this will be, I will need your attention because this, if you follow me, will be really easy to understand that the dawn will be a mess. So what happened, <clears throat> especially after the 60s and the after the 50s, in the, after World War II, and why this third world that was so called was a good thing. They try to succeed, they try to integrate themselves into the world, but they have to say that I can say that from my third from no, go to the slide series. Slide, I put that in today, 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 today. And that's called number 10. I see this slide for 34, yeah. Uh so number 10? Uh, it's number that's number nine, sorry. Nine, self-release environment. It's, it's in the top. Zero nine. That one? Yeah, this one. I thought that was mine. No, that's mine. Oh, no. Uh, 
you go down. So there's 3.9, but it's a PDF. It's not there. No, I don't see it. Okay, I'm going to go. So give me one second. Learn this. What's it called? Zero nine. Uh, so, uh, sorry. And it has IAC in the name? IAC, yeah. Oh. Climate justice? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's called self produced. For one second, please. <laughs> It's coming, okay? <clears throat> so it's not in the drive, I think. Yeah, I don't know why. So I also, I believe that it's very unique, right? So we won't have a recording of that. Oh, yeah, we will. We'll. Or are you going to put it into yeah, put that there into, into drive? Process. Okay. <clears throat> so dependency theory. Dependency theory, yeah. And I'm sure there's a YouTube video yeah. about wealth distribution in the world. So the, the rich countries give money to the poor countries in the form of aid, right? We all know that, right? Is that true? Wealthy countries send money to help out poor countries. Does it really help them? So you know what happened to, to me is that I... Oh, you shared, maybe it's in shared with me. Yeah, no, I guess it's here right now. It's in, I know that works, so let me go to the... So where is the... I can get on it. Yeah, go to slides 234. So, sorry, wait, so I didn't put my, my IAC at the end. So, when you upload yours, it, it replaced mine. So, you have the same thing. Um, so, go to the slides now. It should be there around. And it's a PDF? It's a PDF. I still don't see it. Is it in this? No, no, it's, it's, it's right there. It's, it's, See this right there. I can see that from here. Can you can you refresh? Go to the slides again. And it's not zero zero nine. That's zero nine. It's just zero nine. The zero nine, I see for me, I can see that here. Final flow. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Bingo. Okay. Okay. Can we show it in this mode or I'll open it in PowerPoint? I mean, open it in Acrobat. Yeah. Loading and boom. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry for this. And Command L, wait, what is that? Acrobat is misbehaving. <clears throat>
Okay. So go back down, please. Down, down, down. I don't like, like if you can tell me where it's from. Is this okay? So okay, here we are. So, so we need a slide, a slide 16. 16? Okay. Okay. This one. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I believe, so I need your attention, guys. I believe that this will explain in some way what happened. And this is not me. This is basically. Uh, our, our, our diagram that we did to explain theory of dependence. So, because at the end, what is the system that dominate that have dominated the world? Capitalism. So basically, we live, we live in a capitalist in a capitalist environment. So, according to the economists, there are four things that you need to create a product in a capitalist thing. What are four things? You need to have. You need to have. A material, you have something to build, you need to have tools. If you are creating your product, when you go outside, uh, you need to have materials to do your projects, like paper, computers, and so on. You need uh, you have you need to have tools like the software, like the like the knife and so on. You need to have labor, you need to test it yourself, and you will have a problem. And this is the set the, the core of capitalism to create profit for my this is Marx, and this is also Michael to Freedom. Everyone is explaining that. So, what happened in the world? <clears throat> Imagine that you are that guy, you are Juan, and that creates cycles, like cycles of, 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 of production. If you are Juan, Imagine that you want, so basically, what happened with the third world is that most of third development, the world of free world, free world people, third developed countries, they, they basically have. Material. They produce materials. They are producing uh, commodities. So I come from Venezuela, and I am is also from Venezuela. Basically, we sell oil. To them. This is our role in the world. We sell oil. We do not produce anything with oil. We basically sell oil. So what happened with this guy? Imagine that one. He had a lot of land, and he create and he has he produced here. Let's imagine a road, sand. You have a lot of land. He extract a lot of extraction here. He extracts sand and he sends sand, this sand to the world where th things are manufactured. So he produced in this first cycle, one, create this little piece of sand and put that in a cargo ship here, transportation. And he sell this to a manufacturing country, imagine the Owens Illinois located in Indiana. So they created, they sell. If this is cost, if it's 100, imagine that's 100, let's say $10. They produce this piece of sand and they sell that to the Owens Illinois located in Indiana by this amount of dollar plus cargo. So now the cost of sand is not dollars anymore, but it's 10 plus cargo. Let's imagine that it's 10 plus 10, which is 20. Okay? But because we because we are now in a capitalist system, the manufacturing product produced have the sand, those tools, those labor, plus profit. So we speak that everything that the owners and produced, produce, imagine that with 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 sand they produce glass. You know that. Yeah. If you can transform sand into glass. Then they produce glass, then the cost of the glass is 10, 20, 30, 40, 60. Are you following me? So the cost of glass, including the profits, is now $60. We could do this with Minecraft, right? You yeah. played Minecraft, right? You put in the silicon, yeah. Yeah. sand, yeah. and you get you glass. Sand, but you need labor materials, two of the things. So now this product comes here, but this guy is called one who lives in Colombia. Not, not Colombia, Colombia in Latin America. He now he needs glass because he needs at least a little piece of glass to manage his, his farm extraction. So this glass, because he only produced sand, he only have no produce, he only extracts sand. So this sand piece goes back and spur cycle, 
and he received that for this amount plus the new cargo, you know? So you have to add class plus transportation. So now one has to pay for the class 70. Are you following me? For the class. But he's still selling the same thing. He only can produce then because he only produced uh, commodity, the, the only the first part of the, of the capitalism. So, so, and that is what in the theory of dependence is called the deterioration cycle. There is no way for one in Colombia or in Argentina or in or in Kibera or in Uganda that he can succeed because he saw they are only producing or we are we are only producing raw materials. And the world needs manufactured materials. You are adding value to the materials that are creating more sophisticated pieces. And we have to buy this material to sustain the very expensive. One we can sell, we still sell in the sand or the oil or the wood or whatever we sell. And a very, very, very low, 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 low deposit. It's only one fragment of this equation. Do you follow me? So this happens for it. So you can take this piece of B that is the glass and you can send to another manufacturing process. And in Georgia, and then you, you transform the, the, the glass into, into the streets for the iPhone. And then you have another process where you add tools, labor, profit, and you produce another thing that is even much more expensive. So this glass is extremely more expensive per, per uh, 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 square feet than the glass because it has more value here. Because they are adding more tools, labor, profit. And then they have to sell the one to have the cell phone. And they have to buy, pay seven times two for us two times taxes, which is 80, 90, 100 dollars for that piece of glass while he is still producing them. So this cycle takes forever. And, and when you try to have a third world to be independent, where you are still connected in a global economy, in a capitalist global economy, you can not succeed. It's impossible. And this is probably probably according to that theory. The reason because third world will form a poor community or poor country. Any question about that? I don't know. I hope that was a little a bad lesson. It's, a, it's an oversimplification of the theory of dependence. Yeah. So, uh, like, quote unquote, first and second world countries use up all their materials and then they have to outsource. You, you think you're restricted to the second and the third? The first yeah. and the yeah. second. <laughs> it's cheaper. To get sand from uh, Colombia, it's cheaper, yeah. Than to get it from Indiana, yeah. Because housing in Indiana is the cheapest in the United States, but it's so much more expensive than housing and food and education in Colombia. So uh, the wage in, for extracting sand in Colombia is so much lower. And in the age when fossil fuels were basically free, they only had ten dollars. Uh, to the cost of the sand. It's just so much cheaper to get our sand from Colombia than it is to get it from that, That's a beautiful question. Indiana. Sorry, sorry. That's Colin. Oh, that's a beautiful question because that helped me to explain two consequences about what one can do. So imagine that you are one and you are extracting sand and, and, you, are, and you can sell this piece of sand in the dollar but you have to pay $100 for the manufacturing thing. How you, what you can do to succeed. Imagine that you are in a capital system, you are an entrepreneurial guy in, 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 in Colombia here, or in, or in Uganda. Yeah. What you can do? Juan is really smart, he's, and he wants a better life for his children. Yeah, so he will succeed. He will succeed. He will have more revenues from his construction. Because he's smart, he wants to want to succeed. So what he can do, imagine that you are like an entrepreneurial guy in Uganda. What you can do is very much. You can extract some, yeah. So then say, can he not just be a manufacturer? Oh, yeah. Voila. Is this happening? What needs to happen in order to be a manufacturer? What do you need to happen? Uh, you need tools. You need tools. And, and tools. Tools. what else? And material. You, you already have the material. So what, did you, what else do you need? Well. Like the knowledge, yeah, knowledge. And that's probably the core of the possible solution that we have as an architect. No solutions. 
Yeah. So, so what is missing in this equation, and I think it's still missing, is knowledge that goes directly from different parts of the world in order to be to them to be factors. Yeah. But he has a smartphone. See, see. Oh, yeah, he's got a smartphone. He can just look it up on YouTube. Yeah, that's, that, that's beautiful. Because uh, do you know what is happening with the smartphone? We have the Alexandria library here. We have everything here, but it's like ten percent of all. Uh, Terrible information that we have here. So that's a, that, that's another story. How yeah. to succeed with that? It's, it's a long story because so it's not only so the the issue is knowledge and this is a there is a professor in the Kennedy School of Harvard called uh, Ricardo Hall. He explained that it's not only knowledge; it's a knowledge that matches with your culture that can help people to succeed. It's not only going there and saying, "Oh, this is how we do the thing." Do the same way. If that is not completely connected. Yeah. Yeah. To Anna, I have to say that. Sorry, uh, uh, check. So, <laughs> if, if this is not connected with the particular culture, this is not will won't be embedded in the logic of production. But what is happening right now is that they are not going. We are not going to say we because I come from that. So, so there are three options here. Uh, we, one option is that one move to another country. That's me. We can come to, to Boston. Yeah, we so he came to Boston. That's me. That's Alejandro. Then we say, come on, this is not working. Let me go to do another thing in Boston. This is the third thing, which is not helping to the point. The second thing that, uh, uh, that, uh, 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 that one can do is he can reduce the amount of payment to the laborers who would make extraction. So if I extract 10, and I have to, and, and, and I need to pay two or three dollars for the guy who is tracking the sand, and it's not working, and I have to use more out of that ten dollars. I have to pay cents to these guys. This where uh, the more poor communities come. So this dynamic is producing poverty. Poverty. And there is a third way: just try more. And that comes with a second challenge that right, that Dr. Robert were describing. This is climate issues and environmental action problems. And this is happening, this is still happening. I don't know if you know that Brazil, because they are happy because they are producing a lot of a lot of the beef for the world, a lot of the cows, they are destroying half of the Amazon jungle to produce more, to have more cows in order to feed the world with meat. So, because they need to produce a lot, but they are just selling the meat, they're not manufacturing the meat. So, my point is that this is hurting us with climate and, and poverty. Because, because we are not, the, because the wealth, not the wealth, the knowledge is not equally distributed. What else? What then sh must we do? What else must we do? What then must we do? What then must we do? <laughs> oh, what else? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big question. That's does that take? That's a reason because we're here. Does that take us to Caracas? Yeah, that's exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so, but it's a big question. So, what, what we are, what we are trying to imagine is how we can create a new uh, urban strategy that helps us <laughs> to address this this challenge. So, and and this is something that Wentworth, this institution, has been working with. For a while, so that what we are going to present now is the experience of Caracas. That two amazing scholars created in this university. These scholars were Manuel Delgado and Professor Robert Calvertry. So they they realized that we cannot address everything that we're having here. We do not understand these these issues. So they created in Boston, in Wentworth Institute, Institute of Technology, one program in 2009 that is still going working with the city of Caracas as an example, as a, as a test about how we can address uh, this, 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 this challenge. And they, they call that the signing for life. So, so what we are going to, to, uh, we're going to describe that is a brief summary of that experience, because we want to be optimistic as well as the experience of the signing for life in Caracas. Uh, that is a long-term engagement of Wentworth Institute of Technology of our current school of architecture and design, trying to understand how we can reimagine the world. Or what, how we can reimagine the previously named third world, 
through urban design and architecture. And so why, did, why, why do we care? I, I'm a student here. I'm never going to go to Caracas and, and I don't care about Caracas. I'm going to design, I'm going to stay in Nashua, New Hampshire. I'm going to design houses for people. I'm, I'm not going to Caracas. Why should I care about this? Well, it's because what we were talking about earlier, the problems and issues of Caracas, Venezuela are not staying tidily contained within Caracas, Venezuela. I was walking around Somerville, Somerville, Massachusetts, during Porch Fest. Who went, who went to Porch Fest? Oh, it's awesome. A little crowd. Don't, don't take a part of it. It's crazy. Um, so in Somerville, Massachusetts, walking around, people are with tables say, hey, we have a housing crisis. Uh, artist communities are being displaced. Our housing affordability is being devastated. We have this idea. We want to set up a community land trust. We are setting it up. We have set up a community land trust. And the community land trust in Somerville, Massachusetts, and check it out, look it up. It's in every city. Now, it's in Boston, it's in Cambridge. We have community land trust. It's going to be a topic of future lecture. The knowledge, the understanding of how community land trusts help us with housing affordability, that comes from Latin America. It comes from Caracas, Venezuela. We, the more we understand about the situation in Caracas, Venezuela, the more we understand how to solve our housing crisis right here in Boston. Yeah. So the, what I'm going to present now is a very optimistic project about how we can address the situation in Caracas, Venezuela, with a particular case study that is a transformation of an area of uh, in La Carlota, which is in the center of Caracas, and how we can transform that into a new urban project that helps to create our economic vitality by building the city, but also social inclusion and environmental. Uh, uh, Improvement. So, but, but, but something, and something that I would say, I, I would have to say right now is that continue with the story what, they have, what we had before. So, since 2009, students and faculty here were working with Caracas, and in 2012, Manuel Delgado joined, joined to a comp international competition to transform this air base, the, the La Carlota, with a group from Medellin. Do you remember? Do you remember Medellin? So that was a, like a like a perfect storm. Because these guys work with Sergio Fajardo, the guy that that, that, that the Robert is the, the, the explained last week. Um, so this guy from Medellin joined from with Manuel Delgado from here in Wentworth, and they created a team to participate in that in this competition. They won. So what we're interested in, and, uh, in, in, and this is basically a, a celebration from Manuel. Manuel right. is a great professor from here. He's now retired. Is now in believing in, in, in Girona. If you're going to Spain next semester, you will join Manuel probably. Absolutely. And he will be in front of your reviews. He's an amazing scholar who is now living in Spain. No competition with us anymore. But this is his presentation, his project. Yeah. What you see in the in the in the slides is a combination with with a, with a park and something that is beautiful with this presentation. With this line, this red line that you see here, is a memory. Of the previous uh, airport, so this was there were the airs, the air land before. This year was a big airport, and they transformed that into a into a into a park. But also, what is amazing of this project is that they are not they were not only doing the park, but also understanding that the park and any project guy is an opportunity to improve the whole environment, the whole city, the whole city. Yeah. So you see that this is a park that is outside. There's a uh, uh, and they are basically connecting the park with another park, which is Parque del Este, the east part of Caracas. And they also understood that and that that, so, that the improvement of the park creates economic vitality, so you can also improve the density and it was certain strategy like air rise uh, and, and inclusionary housing. You can have affordability, but also economic improvement around the city. It's how the project is a tool to improve the city. And that is something that we'll ask you to do next semester, Studio yeah. 7. And this will be your case in Studio 7. 
regardless of the section that you do, regardless of the, the city that you, that you should work. It's how we imagine projects, architectural projects, as a tool to create environmental uh, improvement as a way to improve the whole city. Move forward. Okay. Yeah. Or, or yeah. So, so if you look at here, this is the uh, the previous air base now conformed to a park, and this is our, a set of river corridors that goes around from the mountain, the Agala Mountain. Please don't try it, Alejandro. And then uh, to the to the river in the center of the valley, and how this project is a catalyzer to huge transformation. So this is like it's like for me the best message of this project is how the project can help to reinforce the improvement of the whole city and vice versa. How the, the possibility that the whole city has to improve help you to reframe your project, to frame your project. So this is, and, and this is really clear, this little scheme where you have the park, but also these corridors of, of water. There are the quebradas, which is a, a Spanish name to similar to water courses, let's say. Oh, the v. Ravines. Similar Ravine. Ravine. How the they are connected around, how the, this is a as a as a mediator, mediator between between the slippery water system and, and the green system that are in the city. So there, this this is like happening like one. So and 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 finally, this is the strategy. So the next slide we'll see is a, is a, is just evidence demonstration about this strategy. But he says that you have four dynamics happening at the same time. A good urban project. That can introduce a certain level of knowledge in the city that can help people to, to be very integrated into the global economies. That's what we discussed there. That, could, that can break the cycle of deterioration that we discussed before. Uh, we have these four dynamics that work together in a cycle. You need to have a better environmental balance, a park system, with a watershed restoration, a natural landscape of recovery. You have urban dynamics. That, that includes, especially with public transportation, we have, I don't know, we not probably us, I think organists in the world have discovered that transportation is a very important thing for urban renewal. Because it's not, not only because it, we move through public transportation, but also it's the moment where you can have areas of, 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 of improvement. Every time you have a bus stop, it's an opportunity to create something new or something better. And then you have a, a balance between public and private, and especially mixed use development, I have to say that if you took notes of this, you have all the strategies that you will need to yeah. Studio 7 to succeed. Right. Because this is basically what we were asking. These are the rules. Yeah, this is not a Caracas strategy. This is an urbanism strategy. Yeah. It's and what also, we do. And something that is beautiful is the, 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 the and, that, and this is probably something that we can discuss for a while here in the state is the strength of density. The possibility of densification. How when you densify certain areas, you come with a lot of opportunity. And why sometimes <laughs> compact cities where we agglomerate energies works even better if then you spread the, the 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 densification or you spread the houses around the territory like in suburban places. How cities became more environmentally friendly and more uh, create more economic vitality and social inclusions than uh, sorrows that are spread out the, the whole country. And finally, and probably this is the most important one for Manuel and for the team is social encounter. How this dynamic create uh, economic, but also social encounter, education, public space to gather, cultural institution, and the notion of the agra. Do you know what is the agra? I think your last slide, this presentation of this semester talk about the agra. Yeah, <laughs> because you come we, to the past. We will. We will talk about the agra. It's basically the notion of public space. A public space. Yeah, a public space, yeah. Yeah. So these are the urban strategy and they work all together. So we're see here, we can say, so let's look at, take a look at it. Here we're explaining some of the diagram and some of the strategies. So, and probably that can be helping to explain how we create an urban project. We create big urban strategies and we create these kind of areas. They are all under the umbrella of these big strategies. So if you, if you can think that way, you, you will become more a better urban designer. So in this case, they have a view, a huge umbrella in this case that is a strategy called environmental environmental balance, and then they have certain criteria like watershed and natural landscape recovery and balance, and you have design ways to do it. So in this case, doing floodplains that receive the water and, and collectors of, of, of treatment plants for the water and 
and so on. So you will have this presentation. We don't want to go in detail, but my point is that you have you can think in the big strategy, in this case, environmental balance, and then how you do that, how you provide design criteria and, and solutions and ideas that help you to uh, improve this specific strategy. Yeah. So, uh, or your diversified fauna and you create a strategy to do it. Or not, that's it. I like this idea. Or you create, and that creates uh, a new urban uh, 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 townscape. So, and how this, so these big ideas are for the new life for, for citizens. Yeah. Or, or, or uh, this is the second one is urban dynamic is diversifying public transportation. This is a big tool that they discovered for uh, uh, public transportation is, is not only about reducing cars and creating more public transit, which is good, but also to create a multiple ways to tra transport and in creating nodes of connection in these modes. Let me explain that better. So the good city, in this case, what he explained, this node where you can park your car in a park or ride and stop your car and take a train, and from the train you, you, you move to another cable car, and from the cable car you go to a great sidewalk. And this connection between one system and the other is what creates that connection and growth. So it's not pretending that you can solve everything with one single form of transportation, but that was a systemic connection of different forms of transportation that are overlapped and they all work together. Yeah. So yeah, these are how this works at the, at the micro scale. Again, you are giving this and how this is looks like. So if you again I would understand the logic of the presentation, you have the strategy, the, the design tools, and how it looks like in this case, why a rail could be something that is as or horrible as, as the green lines is horrible, where you only have the bus and a single canopy, and the police transportation as an opportunity to create this, an urban landscape, densification, horse near a, a, a bike lane. An area that you have porosity to manage uh, to adapt to flooding and climate change. So these these images will pass itself a lot of things. They are managing flooding. They are creating new facilities for education and for cultural encounter. You bring people to walk around different forms of transportation and economic vitality. Can you see that? So you have to be capable to do this in your project with one single image. Summarize a lot of the strategies that working together, that works is the most important one. Working together creates a, a better thing. Yeah. Uh, some of how this disintegration of nodes happens across the city. Again, we're, we're, we're not planning, and this comes from the, from the local to the international. So, and, and I, I don't want to stop here, but this is a strategy also to, to manage emergencies in the case of, 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 uh, uh, of any. Uh, uh, natural disaster. They were also creating places where you can have camps for refugees and also be uh, places for transport people with these huge helicopters. So my point is that the good, the good thing of a good public space that is also the place where you can manage, that you can use for managed disaster uh, in, in place in case of, 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 of natural emergency. So again, you have this presentation, guys. If you have any particular questions, Read that uh, this is in, in, in bright space and um, and ask us. We can discuss that in a more level of detail. <laughs> I'm sorry. So the, the third one is the combination between mixed different mixture. This is another thing that we have discovered as an organism. Mixing things is a good way to create better environments. You mix public space, but also you mix income and you mix rent genders and you mix races. The mixture is a tool to put all together. Instead of separating us in different fragments, as Sonny did in the 50s, how we can create new strategies that put all together. So in this case, they were creating this. They work with uh, air rights to create these different houses that have a combination between uh, uh, a base of commercial retail and housing, but also mixed with, uh, with, with uh, affordable housing with, with, with an inclusionary strategy. And this is basically what I'm doing, imagining how the surrounding of the park will be redensified to create this strategy in a, in a broad scale. Is that a rape? <clears throat> uh, no, this is not well. 
It looks very arepa. I know, I know it's very arepa, but it's Manuela. Oh, okay. Yeah, everything that we know about it. And here, how this looks like in the set. So again, how this like, and how, for example, in this case, the air rights uh, are very proper in certain areas, mm -hmm. and like, uh, 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 highways can create new desification, new public space, but how this public space create economic vitality to that include densification, and that densification create affordability, and how the, the the cleaning of the opening of the water courses create a landscape that can manage uh, growing. <clears throat> and how that looks. So again, I have to say something. I, I worked a lot with poor communities, you know, with underprivileged communities. I have I spent 15 years of my life working with Petai, which is the, the biggest self-producing environment in Caracas. And I am a believer uh, that Petar, that is Petar, that I am a believer that having money around it. So, um, so not because you are working for the poor, that doesn't mean that you cannot have a fancy restaurant, that people who are with wealthy people can also engage, and that come with also tax uh, <laughs> revenues that you can also use for the public. So working with the capitalist system is something that we discovered here, it's not working against, it's working with. And this is a big discussion that we can have with a beer later. And it has to do I'm with- sorry, you are not, you are, you are, you can. You no. are on the right, you can afford the coffee later. Is, is why, why we can be against, be against capitalism? Why not work with to create this improvement? Yeah. And there are the questions. Yeah. We get, we get some points here. So, and basically, the strategy is mixtures to so create more mixtures of, 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 of resources. There are many ways to do it. <laughs> Come on. What is that? Kind of response. A check mark is a little premature, I think. <laughs> check mark, really? Yeah. I mean, you got to ask it again. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm cheating. I'm cheating. <laughs> yeah. So, social encounter game, everything here I said that before is to put people together, to put, to gather people, because at the end, that's another thing. I don't know if you remember by the previous class that where we discussed. This idea of, 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 of uh, the, I call that, that last class, the over-enumeration. And this could be a, a, another answer for this, a second check. So as, as we, last week we discussed that, that when you create public space, John, you can have, you can match knowledge. It's not only creating knowledge, but match knowledge. Having two people that can work together and match their ideas, skills, uh, their knowledge to create something. The creation and innovation happen when you put people together. And when you create and you, and you gather with the other. I know that happens you also in the studio. I don't know if you have the same feeling as me. Sometimes you're in the studio working with your desk and you have no idea how to access your project. And so you start to walk around and go to the vending machine and you talk with someone and someone tells you something and you say, oh, that's idea. When you start sharing ideas, something comes, some creation comes, some innovation comes. So the public space is a tool that this project did in order to create this space for sharing that can improve creation and innovation. Yeah. And that's what cities do. That's, that's what cities do. That's that, what, that should be the essence of the show. It's what Boston does. Look at what's going on here. Mm -hmm. I've never learned so much in a class. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also that you can you can and that, that is funny because in Sony we tend to create a bit you have if you remember all of Sony projects that you have seen in your product in your studios, there are basically zones of program, education, zones of residential zones. What these what this is producing instead of having zones of this program, you have spots of this program that could be together. Why not? Why not you can have an area that have recreation and economic development at the same time? Why you don't you create a strategy, a building that have, um, um, I don't know, um, uh, residential plus industries at the same time? And that creates the improvement of this sharing that this is, this is, that this is a proposal. And this is the opposite of what Corbusier, remember <laughs> History Theory 2, we looked at the Radiant City. Corbusier said, there's a zone for residential. There's another zone for commercial. 
There's a zone for administration and a zone for recreation. And they're far away from each other. So we need lots of roads and highways and parking and helicopters so that they're all connected because they're so far apart. This is the recipe for solving that crisis that was caused by that vision by Corbusier in the 20s that we then built. It, we spent 60 years building that up. And now we've got to undo that and do the opposite. We've got to mix everything together everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and how does it look like? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the beauty of the public space, that's another thing to get the guy in. Because I have to, so sometimes I realize in your students that you design the building and everything that happens from the border of the facade towards outside this yard is not your responsibility. If there is a landscape architect or whatever that can solve that. This beautiful public space it could only be designed as we can have a bus by an architect. So, the public space, the open areas, is also a tool for design. It's also a project, an architectural project, even if it's has no uh, environmentally controlled, or, or even if you have no roof. So what, what's something that we're inviting here in urbanism is that to believe or to understand that we also are agents of the design of the open areas. We have, we have to design the open areas. This is also our responsibility. Not only the building, but also the change, the connection between the building and the outside. And, and the outdoor areas. And obviously, you have different scales. So this is a one part of the project where you can gather, I don't know, one million people together for a protest or a concert. Shakira being there presented that to other ones. So sometimes you meet. That's another thing that is beautiful in public space. You have different scales. Sometimes I went to sit here <coughs> with my wife and stop slowly while looking at some trees in the middle of a small park. And sometimes I want to gather with everyone looking at, I don't know, gorillas uh, in the middle of this huge presentation. Dua Lipa. Or Dua Lipa. Yeah. This could be Dua Lipa, yeah. And yeah. you can also have cows flying around because it's an idea. Yeah. 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 So in conclusion, this is basically uh, in conclusion of, of, of this project. So how this, you can see that here, this is the boundary of the project. Okay, so this is the boundary of the new part, or the, uh, that it was, it came from the transformation of an air base. But how this corridor transforming to this public plaza that connects here, that connects with this part within this neighborhood, and then how this neighborhood connects with, with water source that is connected with this public transportation that permits you to go to this place, this place where I used to be. And then you can connect here and together with public spaces that also included in this uh, um, shopping mall that is, that is also a corridor that connects this with this fragment that connects here with to here. So I'm gonna be here and I walk around for a while and then in 30 minutes I'm in another part of the city because everything is connected. Everything is bridged. Can I say something? <laughs> yeah. One of the reasons this is so effective is because of the change. We don't have any photos of what it is now before this vision, but it, there's a chain link fence and there's a military air base. And so this is a symbol of oppression of the people of Venezuela. And it's, it makes this neighborhood isolated. You can't get here because there's this military base in the way. And this is isolated from that. This is like, it's like, it's a source of extreme isolation and it's symbolic of oppression. And you can take the worst places. And this is a strategy that you might want to keep in mind as you move forward, because the thesis students are always doing this. They identify the worst sites anyone has ever seen and they make it, they transform it from the worst possible place to the best possible place. And it's the change. I need to provide more detail about that. Please. It's a great topic. So today, I would have the image, but imagine that this is a highway. And this is basically a, a fence with an air base. In this specific spot, I'm sorry, it's not here, it's here, this specific spot. In one of the protests against Maduro, the right. current dictator, 
in that spot was killed by the ninja. So by the ninja was a student, your age, and he was in that highway protesting against the dictators. It was like five years ago? Uh, this is 2014. Oh, okay, 10 years ago. Yeah. Wow. 10 years ago. 10 years ago. That's wow. So, and the government decided to kill him because he was protesting. Uh, and that is happening every time they try to protest. So, and something that is really beautiful is that Manuel decided to call this plaza the Valle Ninja Square. Hmm. That's great. And uh, the other thing that I, when, when you gather yourself, you can continue. Uh, we had our first Designing for Life event in 2009. The mayor of Medellin came to uh, Wentworth and, and really helped us understand these issues. We had our second Designing for Life event in 2013 to celebrate not just the winning entry of this competition, but the runners up, we invited uh, Manuel. This is the kind of man Manuel is. He said, there were so many amazing submissions to this competition. There were so many fantastic ideas and it would be foolish and self-destructive of us to just build this and ignore all of the great ideas that these other competitors uh, put in. So Manuel being Manuel, he came to me and said, Robert, let's do this. Let's have another Designing for Life and let's invite those excellent colleagues who didn't win and have everyone share what they proposed. Uh, and so we can, because we're not gonna build this, uh, if the, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna build something that is this plus better ideas that came from all the competitors. So the mayor of Caracas who sponsored this competition came to Wentworth because mayors come to Wentworth to talk with architects about architecture. And that's what we did. And you tag you in now. Yeah, yeah the beautiful of that moment that so I have two things to connect. One is, there are two things. One, the previous discussion we were having. The beauty of this thing of the Bajanilla Square is that the architect was able to understand a systemic problem, in this case, the dictators and understand one specific moment in the space where this is reflected. How this little space where that guy was killed is a symbol of the huge system of operation. And by transforming this space into a new plaza, he is making a political statement against the dictator. So, and I'm trying to connect it with your first comment, Robert, is project change systems and create culture. Right. So he's doing, the change in a little space because he's connected with the big culture of So and this is basically what we, you were doing this year, is trying to understand how a system of oppression happens in space and how this transformation can have a new reframe of the huge problem. This is my first comment, and I know my 20%. And the second thing is, this wasn't the, this was the, 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 this project you're seeing on the screen, is, is the final version of Manuel's project. The previous one was, was good, but not that good. <laughs> and the reason because this is that good, because he included the idea from others. Yeah. So in that moment, I was put it to Berlin. I have to say that I, I, I was, I, I got uh, an honorable mention of this competition. I participated and I didn't win. Because Manuel, uh, I didn't, we didn't win, sorry. Manuel won the competition. But Manuel invited me to Boston. I was living in Caracas and was here. I met Robert for the first time. And it was here, I never believed that I was living, talking with you that year, that amount of year later, that was a while ago. And I came here to discuss the project. And with something that is beautiful here is that this is my project, I can recognize that. But I can see here certain things that he took from my idea. Oh, yes? Yes. Show us. So this idea, for example. So we introduced you the and, project the idea of the air rights. You and Fran. You and me, me and Fran. We introduced the idea of the air rights. I said, if, if Boston have a lot of air rights, why not using their right for connected? So we proposed the idea of creating certain platforms that create this connection. Between the, the freeway. The, yeah, on top of the freeway. I'm going to say, oh, that's nice. And he integrated that in this project. So in some ways, I look at this project and also is mine, does that which piss, is beautiful. Does that piss you off? 
No, that is the opposite. Oh. No, that's the opposite. I'm really happy that, that I can discuss about that, explain my lost project, but also recognize my ideas there. And but, this is how, how good projects work. But why do we care? Air rights, you can only do that in Caracas, right? You could never do that in Boston, could you? Oh, wait you air rights Boston? Could you do air rights in Boston? What is air rights? You know where? Yeah. 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 Where where have we done that? Do you, is there an example? Well, well mass pipe. What's there about mass pipe? So oh, a credential center is air rights just like this. The Rose Kennedy Greenway, and that new project at Mass Ave, not far from air rights. And and when you graduate. Joint firm Boston, it's very likely that you're going to be working on something very closely related to what is going on here because we're in the process of developing our rights over freeways all over the place. The billions and billions of dollars that are being invested in cities right now, a big part of it is air rights development. So, and, and the good thing here again is, is that the beauty of this platform is that these create this connection. But at the same time, that allows the people with money to build a building. And so we are helping the system, but also at the same time, helping the system in several ways to create economic vitality, but also social inclusion. This is the most, this is the, that is the most difficult thing to do. And this is your, the challenge that we have. Right. It's the challenge. Instead of 15% inclusionary zoning, why not 20? And instead of 80% of median income, why not 50% of median income? Why not 90% of the units being developed? Because you couldn't build this building without the government helping you out. In exchange, instead of 15% of the units being affordable, uh, let's make 90% of the units affordable because 90% of the population are being squeezed to death by housing affordability crisis. Mm -hmm. So let's let's make a new deal. And this is part of what architects do is we negotiate things and we promote things and we uh, advocate for changes in the system to actually, so we can do a better job fighting against housing affordability and improving the quality of the city. Yeah, and this is not a spoiler of something that we'll discuss in two weeks, but Urban project, urban infrastructure creates increased land values. What? Yeah. Say, I, what? Say that again. Anything that you put in the land increases the value of that land. Public infrastructure increases land value. So the question is, what are the strategies that we can have to capture certain amount of these lands, the increase of land values, to do other things, to include, to design for one? That's it, person. And we will discuss that again. Because at a certain moment in history, it was disconnected. Yeah. And it's our job to reconnect. Yeah. Okay. Actually, in other of that, uh, so in the last class, in, in the seminar, I have to say something that happened in my class that was unique. And what I want happened? to share that with everyone. What when, when were, so we were discussing what is the cost of, the, of a car? What is, what is the cost of having a car? And they were very knowledgeable. So especially the Felicity, you have to pay for the car, you have to pay for the car itself, you have to pay for insurance, you have to pay for uh, for reparations, tires, and some parking spot, and so on. And gasoline. And, and gasoline, and so on. And it took a while. It took a while for us to understand that there was a collective cost for having the car. I don't own a car, so... It doesn't cost me anything that you own a car, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, but, yeah, but the beauty of that conversation is that we discover, for us, for example, it's really easy to understand what are the individual costs of having a car, everything that we say. But when we start adding okay, the cost of the road and the, the cost of the contamination and the cost of climate change and, 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 and 
and and body. And social isolation. Collect. Social isolation. So, yeah, social isolation. So and this is also the cost of the car that we're paying for that. Right. So if we understand and this is the connection that we need to do. The connection between the individual and the, and the, and the um, we we should I think we should spend a week talking about automobility. Yeah, we will. We will. Yeah. Okay. Yes, really That's a good idea. Let's okay, so let's move. <laughs> so we have 30, twenty-five minutes. So let's move forward. What we're planning to show now, so after these general images of how the car looks like, is that after after that happened, and this is something that you can be involved with. So we decided to do an exhibition. I don't know if you were here last year. If you remember the exhibition we have in the CAS lobby about the future of a project, that was basically the consequence of designing for life, not the consequence. That was framed in designing for life. Designing for life one, we have Sergio Fajardo came to Wentworth to discuss the, uh, the learning from Medellin. Designing for life two, Mayor of Caracas, Antonio Ledesma came here to discuss La Carlota. And designing for life three was last year in that exhibition where we showed cases. 160 proposals made by the students between 2009 and, uh, uh, and 2013, uh, where we were discussing that thing, uh, or that these ideas, how we can create the design for inclusion and design for life. 2022, really? Yeah, 2022, yeah. So, so that was, did you, yeah. So that was the signing for a So that was the exhibition that happened at the CAS lobby. So basically we pre-created certain models and having a space for lecturing and, and how we have different, we use urbanism as a way to discuss all of these strategies, in this case, in the specific case of Caracas. And each, all of these five screens that you see here, were basically a, a, a screen where we showed the 116 project made by the student. Where are you going? Yeah. <laughs> they were talking, yeah. So my point is that there is, a, there is a, another tool here that, that we are trying to do is this evidence, explaining that, that story. So now we have a set of slides. So yeah, oh, yeah I think this is the same. Same? Yeah. Okay, so this is the exhibition. And we have, yeah, we have the project of the students, this, the images of the city of Caracas, project of models of project of the students, and, and, and one huge, how many feet have this thing? Like yeah. one by six. It's like nine meters? Like nine, yeah. What is that in feet? Like 30 feet? Like 30 feet, yeah. 30 feet. Yeah, it's six feet, yeah. Can you go for it? So, but if you, if, what you see here, and this is basically, the learning from this project is that you have here a water course and you can have a mixture of informal, sorry, self-reduced environment here, yeah. but also, and also new redevelopments and also some projects. So everything that you see something in white is a project of one student that tried to be embedded in a public system. And everything that you see in this teaches are public spaces that we are trying to create, for example, this building with these buildings uh, to connect this community through this market, through this corridor, to engage with this park. So it's basically imagining that we can do next. Imagining that you do projects, and these projects are not only there to uh, to create beautiful spaces inside, but also beautiful connections towards the inside, and also towards between inside and outside. And how that helps you to create certain urban synergy. So this is basically, this building, our, and this building, is the compilation of social encounter, economic vitality, uh, environmental uh, um, control, and the fourth one that I'm not and a mixture. So how we, and, and, and the, how we were doing that with the, with the students here. Yeah. Yeah, next. I think, yeah. And this basically is another model that we're trying to imagine how building our schools to create to reinforce and create certain levels of connectivity. I don't want to go into detail. And we also, and I, that will be repeated at the end. So we'll move forward. Oh. Yeah. So what we're trying, we're planning to do how, uh, now as, and I need next, 
and trying to help you is that we, we develop that in one, two, three, four, five, six semesters. And, and this is the all people that were involved with this uh, project, including these professors, Bill, Paul. so these are a lot of people involved in this project when, when, for this exhibition. And the, the exhibition compiled these experience of these six semesters. So we're showing now some images of the students. Now it's our summer of 19, and this is basically the first image that we have in this class <laughs> uh, some weeks ago, and how the building can be an infrastructure to uh, the, to uh, provide opportunities to this particular isolated community in Petale Caracas. You want to say something? No. Okay, this is summer 2019. So I, I, I think there are a lot of images here where we do not expect to explain all of them, but to move forward and to explain how so the students can be, or you, or your design can be involved in creating certain moments that creates connections and and I, I don't let's stop here. I think this is particularly beautiful. This is yeah. called the nine. I wasn't here, uh, but I, I think it's really beautiful because what it's highlighting is the system of landscape that you create to connect community. But at, this, but at the same time, the community is there. So it's, it's a beautiful diagram because it shows the context while showing the proposal and how it works together. I think. Yeah, in, in the falls of 2019, there was a rower. I'll just explain this briefly or not. Yeah, this is, I, I was talking to my class about this when we were looking at the Metro Cabale, the cable car, the gondolas that, that connect the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill in the King of Spain Library Park. Here's uh, a case where the, uh, there's a Metro cable gondola system connecting the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, where uh, and I think it was Ignacio, you, you pointed out, it doesn't really help people because uh, it doesn't help us get up and down the hill. Are there other ways? So, so we were planning, uh, these students figured out other ways to connect the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill that actually helps people. So right. if you notice, the beauty of this project is that the, the, the architecture is not in a plot. So we understand that there is architecture everywhere. So we, it's not only it's waiting for the developers to create a plan and to give us a plot to design a project. Here, there is no plot. It's a system. It's a system. Buildings yeah. are connected right. to create something different. And we were working with the community here. We had Christina Davila, I think, was uh, there. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And you know, students speculating on what kind of system approach would solve these problems for the community. Yeah, fall 2020. So again, what we're trying to do today is to give you some examples that students did to address the topic of these two weeks and the next week. Basically the design of design for life, the right to the city in these particular environments of the self produced environments and in underprivileged communities and how they are addressing this project. This is a great one, by the way. I select like only one for this year. So this is in La Carlota, they decided to work in, 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 the, in, the, in the public transportation system, the metro system. You move forward? And, and, and how you, they recognize at a particular spot that have a compilation of different plots that can help you to create this connection that the city needs in order to reconnect this area of the park with the rest of the fabric. And how the building is comes from the understanding of the of the fabric of the site. You can see that I mean, so every street comes finish in one particular public space and how the public space articulates you to the other part. So the articulation of this is the most beautiful part. The, the articulation of fabrics is the most beautiful part of this project by Kate Andrew, who's now in first Kate. No, he's finished at RISD. He's finished. I don't know what he's doing now. Yeah. But he he conceived of the national rail system, how all the rail lines of the entire country converge on this one location. And how when you have the conversion of different parameters from the transportation system, it's an opportunity to have density, folk space, vitality, uh, mixtures of public, of public and private and so on. And this is his problem. And one of the things you'll hear us say over and over again is in the Netherlands and in Japan, to find the train station, you look for the tallest buildings. 
And in the United States, to find the train station, you look for the biggest parking lot, right? It's backwards, but it presents a tremendous opportunity for us to build, to redevelop places that were parking lots. And that's what architects are doing now all over the United States. Conceiving circulation systems because the success of these transportation nodes depend to a large extent on how many steps from the train platform to getting on the bus. So and this is the type of diagram we expect you to the next semester, by the way. It's not only, not only the project, but also how the project integrates with other systems of the city, in this case, make bike lanes. Yeah, this semester you're integrating structural systems, mechanical systems, and envelopes. Next semester you are integrating transportation, public space, public amenities, housing affordability. It, you just, it's really about integration. So yes, uh, spring of 2022, uh, they did the project of, of redensification and filling housing in one particular neighborhood, but how housing creates better streets, so we go forward, and, and, and create more public spaces, housing not only by housing, but all housing in addition of creating the spaces for public connections or protection of public spaces. Uh, yeah. So there is a video at the end. So we have to move a little, little faster. And, and fall 2021. So, so basically you, we use a tool called Spatial Computer Index that is basically a way to understand where you can distribute uh, yeah, resources in the territory. Go ahead. And that, that, this is too long. Yeah, we can move forward. Yeah, you have this video. It's so pretty. So this is the I, I would love to see that because it's fun. <laughs> so basically, we were working this video. This is more Arepa stuff. This is Arepa. Arepa is the firm of uh, Ignacio Cardona and Fran Paul. Yeah. So basically, we were discussing how we all together create different. So every students were doing a composite model, like a, a comprehensive model, where each student were developing their project. But at the same time, understanding how these projects are connected. So it's a common project, but it's only an individual project. We do that in the studio uh, um, dynamically. So and this is, we were defining the projects in the studio while working with folks. Yeah. Yeah, next. Yeah, and from there, next. So from there, again, you can see that presentation in the next. So these are, these are more specific. Next. Yeah, I think we can just skip that. And from there, they come with this idea of layering, which is very important in urbanism. So you have the urban fabric and the, and the green and that with how this is layered with different pedestrian movement, but with different transportation, but also with density. So after you take the information comes through the understanding of how they move forward. And yeah, we have different diagrams to produce these overlaps. And, and different proposal that comes after these overlaps comes together to create this public space system and green corridors that create densification, but also new public spaces and new, and new institutions. Yeah. Okay. And, and finally, last semester, we did the final round. So this is still fall 2021. And last semester, we did the final round in Petaren, one self-produced environment. So we select the self-produced environment and start <laughs> to understand the different areas of risk and this, the distribution of institutions. We work with, we'll, you will be work with GIS. You will learn GIS and how to map what is happening. You will speculate a little bit how you can use architecture to create different type of connections in the city. And then you will create different systems that we understand them isolated or understand how they work together. So these are from a different system. And finally, you will be, and this is the final slide for today, guys. So, uh, so we work with this tool in this particular self produced environment. So, so it's a, and everything that we have this, it's a projection of the idea into a model of the city. 
in this case of Petale, and students were understanding how systems like mobility or transportation create different nodes of vitality and, uh, and recognizing how they are connected with the risk and recognizing how, and understanding how you can intervene and create new projects that respond to these systems. So we were trying to do is how the system invite you to recognize spaces like this spot where you can make an intervention and at, at the architectural level that helps you to reinforce or to improve this system. In this case, for example, uh, Jan, she was under, she was working with the uh, with the different uh, connections around and the facility that we have around the city, and understanding that with the chip that butterflies, how this system, these institutions can fly towards inside the neighborhood to to, to also reinforce or to connect or to uh, provide resources to the neighborhood. This is Kyle. So Kyle was working with water flows and how water flows between spots of interventions and how you try like like areas of rivers and how these help you to recognize where to intervene and to create a specific project how to address this particular system in this case water flow so so I'm trying to connect this with the with the first thing that we discuss is so as so the first step is recognizing what is there and critically and saying what is possible for the opportunities that the city has and try to connect these opportunities to create the shared spaces that we have before. So try to connect that again with the with the, the de deterioration cycle, the theory of dependency is not only providing knowledge, it's providing a knowledge that understand the system that is so they are already there and trying to connect the system to improve the whole the whole environment and how specific points of intervention help you to connect uh, opportunities and to connect the resources and to connect people that will they be able to thrive if they are connected so i can i can finish this this lesson like really philosophical so there is a, a lady from the university of chicago called martha nostra She's a philosopher. She's amazing. And she defines something that's called human capability. She said that people, any people in the world, regardless of his races, background, socioeconomic status, any person can succeed. Any community can succeed, but only if they are connected. She said that you can scarf this poor code to see the project in the gallery. So, so, but. But what, what, what Martin was going to say that human capabilities, don't, they don't come. They don't come from the skill that we have, but from the moment when our skills are connected to the environment, the system, to the society. So I can be an amazing designer, but if you don't ever have a client and a place to work, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to design. But human capability, and this is our role, is how we create opportunities for people to connect their skills their knowledge, their, their capacities to the broad environment, to the broad society, and to the broad uh, uh, scene. That's a great punchline. Thank you, everyone. Thank you